turn to the books then a little bit and kind of talk about the aspects that you have in it. So let's start first with the easy part of like, what's the argument you're making? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the argument is sort of, is multifold, but it's, it's sort of, when we think about historical memory, we often think about uh, how historical memory is selective, right? And this is, this is the classic thing, and this is what I was taught uh, as an undergraduate um, and uh, in my Civil War history class is that memory is selective. And so when we study memory, we're not just studying what's remembered, we're also studying what's forgotten, right? Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the classic sort of approach to memory is what's forgotten is as important. And that's, that's where some of the best analysis comes from is what's forgotten. I have a diff slightly different take, and that is that in addition to the selectiveness and what's forgotten, there's a third element we often forget, and that is memories that are fake, memories that are fabricated after the fact, that are false lies, if you will, that fundamentally were created to cover over some of what's being forgotten. And so when we sort of think about that element, what I argue is that the lost cause, um, which I think most of your viewers will probably know what the lost cause is, right? This narrative that white oh, Southerners, uh, really pro, I should say pro-Confederate white Southerners really propagate, um, was not just a design to uphold white supremacy, that's part of it, but also that it was fundamentally based on lies and that lies played a fundamental aspect in upholding white supremacy. And that by looking at these lies, we can learn a lot about the way the lost cause worked and its purpose. And so it's not enough to just debunk these lies. We have to understand why they were crafted in the mm -hmm. first place and the purpose they served once they were accepted as the truth. Because right. lies, even after they're accepted as the truth and they're just falsehoods, right? Because the person doesn't know they're a lie, who's repeating them, doesn't change the impact, right? And, um, and I felt like lies really are a methodological tool that we don't use enough mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. lies are not only, and, and this in part, I think comes out of really looking around what's going on in our country as, as all history books are a product of the times they're written, um, let's be clear. I mean, there's an element here of when we look at lies and white supremacy and the role they play in today's society, it matters. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, um, so some of the things that sort of disappear because of lies are things like desertion, things like the horrors of slavery, things like um, white dissenters. I mean, this is sort of the solid South is a creation of the post-war era. There is no solid South if you're in North Carolina in, a, in the 1870s or 1880s or even the 1890s, right? In the 1890s, North Carolina, the governor is elected by a biracial coalition. You have the, 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 the fusion movement come back and the Republican Party in North Carolina, it's estimated somewhere in the order of 30% of it was white. I mean, so there's not this solid white South that's operating that's created by disenfranchising African-Americans until you disenfranchise African-Americans. And so the ties between racism and the lost cause um, and lies is the analysis I wanna, and wanna look at. And what I basically find is that um, these lies continue to shape not only how the public understands the civil war and the society around us, but how so in some cases historians still understand that some of these lies have been propagated beyond and they actually are still being propagated by historians in ways that they don't always realize. And so some of these sort of, I mean, the easy aspects that we all know, right? The war was about slavery. I don't have to sell that to your audience, I imagine, but um, s slavery has something to do with it. We all know, right? But, and that's one that like, despite the fact that when they're putting up these monuments, they keep saying slavery has nothing to do with the war. We know that to be false. But other aspects about sort of how well Confederates fought have been accepted and they need re 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 to be reanalyzed. And I think we need a, a reassessment of the Confederate war effort mm -hmm. with a knowledge of, of memory, because I think when it comes to other scholars, one thing I'm arguing is that, you know, and this is something that say Earl Hess um, said and Gary Gallagher have both sort of said uh, in their pieces from like what, 2014, that, you know, memory scholars really need to know the war to do a good job talking about memory of the war. And I don't disagree with that, but I would say that the reverse is also true, that scholars of the war need to understand the memory of the war to a properly study the conflict itself. And that by studying the memory of the war, we can actually learn a lot about the conflict. And so there are aspects um, that I think 
remain in the history, um, in the historiography. Um, and finally, I, I'd say that from a larger point of why this all matters, the book argues that these lies are still shaping our society in ways we don't recognize always. And that historical narratives are how we create identity. Historical narratives are also how we understand how we got where we are today, right? And so if we wanna solve societal problems today, we have to understand how we got there. And so if we have bad history or bad memory, I should say, right? Yeah. If we have yeah. a distorted memory of the past, understanding we can't treat the problem properly. So we can only treat the symptoms. And so if we misunderstand how discrimination has continued, then we can see the world in a way um, that allows us to believe, frankly, inaccurate worldviews about what's going on today as well. And I think the last thing it, it, the book shows is that um, it's not enough to just call out lies when you're dealing with um, attacks on democracy. I mean, North Carolina saw essentially an end of democracy in the 1890s, early 1900s. Um, democracy was sort of brought to an end for African-American voters, at least. And, and lies played a really large role in that. And so lies are an existential threat to democracy. Um, and yeah. it's, it's debunking them is not enough. People debunked the lies at the time. People said, you know, actually the war was about slavery. And people said at the time, you know, that's not true. But if people accept those lies because they're convenient, and Americans have historically accepted lies that they should know better about. And they probably yeah. did know better about, but those lies fit the political views they had. And so they accepted them. And in fact, this is something I took from Masha Gessen, the, the journalist who looks at you know Russia and the United States. Lies can be used as a form of power. They are an expression of power. When, when you say a lie to an audience and everyone in the room knows it's a lie, but no one can say you're lying, that is the ultimate, in some ways, expression of power, right? You're like, I'm on, I'm, I am powerful because I can make you listen to my lie and I can make you accept it. And so we see that in today's society as well, I think. Um, and we saw it in the, I think, the uh, early 20th century as well, um, when I think Julian Carr knew better when he said some of these things. And we know he knew better because he would turn around oh, two weeks later and say something else. Um, and so um, it took a lot of effort sometimes to, to, to sort of find these lies, but I think there's a lot left to find too. I mean, I think this is the start. Um, I'm hopeful that other scholars will begin looking more deeply at this eff uh, into this effort of lies because I think um, I, un I scratched the surface. I uncovered um, a variety of different lies ranging from individuals who didn't exist to pension fraud um, and to exaggerating the numbers of soldiers. I mean, there's all these sort of lies that I found and, and none of these had been looked at. And so if I was able to find these, who knows what's next for the next generation of scholars. So I look forward to seeing what, you know, the graduate students of today and the, the next generation of scholars are able to find as they start to think about, wait a minute, how do we read these sources truly critically? 